those who haven't been for the first uh, two weeks. So let's remind them uh, what happened last week. What did we do? Talked about morality. How do we talk about morality? What did we, what kind of exercises did we do? I was here for the second week, but in the first week, we were given a bunch of like scenarios oh. um, where we had to make uh, a judgment about like whether, let's say, we'd save one person or not. And we kind of have to rationalize why we would choose to save one person. Yeah. So we had a bunch of uh, case studies. Uh, some of them are real. So Subway Hero. Um, we also had Wang Yue very fa famous case study in China. And then we had a philosophical, a hypothetical scenario of a girl drowning in a pond, or in our case, in the harbor, uh, and then somebody who is far away in South America. Will we help the person giving up some of our finances? So that was the introduction first week. But then in the second week, we tried to model this in something a little bit more simple. So we're talking a lot about trolley dilemmas. So in the trolley dilemma, uh, the scenario is uh, we have a choice of some sort. Um, one of those seems more utilitarian, saving the most uh, lives. So if it goes down the tracks, it's about to hit five people. Uh, will you take action in order to lift the liver, in order to have it go to the other side? And we were discussing how do we know how people will really act, not in hypothetical situation, but in real life. And we showed some mind-blowing studies about trolley dilemmas with mice, right? So Dries did some amazing studies with mice in order to show that actually what people say that they will do and what they end up doing with mice is not very uh, aligned. And then we thought, okay, we can't take this further away than mice. Uh, can it really be done with people? And then we watched a TV show that was hard to watch about actually a person facing a trolley dilemma in real life, right? And then we discussed a little bit of AI. So I'm going to wrap up the issue with morality and trolley dilemma, uh, the first part of this uh, session, and then we're going to talk about something called factfulness based on a very famous book by mm -hmm. Hans Rosling. So to sum up the morality and factfulness, yeah, these are the general things, moral machines. So for a very long time, since the 1970s, we thought we're playing hypothetical games with folly dilemmas. Okay, so you can go to this track, you can go to that track, you can lift the lever, you can jump off the bridge, yes or no, all that fun uh, hypothetical to some people. <laughs> some people find it to be a little bit disturbing. But then we realized it's becoming really urgent that we test every possible trolley dilemma out there. Why has it become very urgent in the last 20 years to test every possible trolley dilemma out there? What has been happening around us that requires us to understand trolley dilemmas? So it's been happening um, for a very long time. We were alerted that this is going to happen very, very soon for about 15 years. It's still ongoing, but in some places in the world, West Coast, US, Germany, not too far away from our border with Shenzhen, you have self-driving autonomous vehicles that are actually making a lot of decisions, right? And when we are drivers, you know, we kind of got used to people making these decisions. Maybe these decisions are okay. Maybe these decisions are not okay, but it's people, we have free choice. We should be able to make such decisions. But then what happens when a machine needs to make these decisions? We need to let the machine know what happens. Should they go to this path or that path? The question is who should make these decisions? Should we let the machine just decide randomly on its own where to go. Right now, who is deciding this for us? Tesla, programmer sitting in a dark room somewhere in the Tesla offices, programming, who knows what, right? We've got the Google people, we've got the German people, we've got the Chinese people, each with their own uh, car manufacturer, with some programmers, do we know anything about their morality? Do we agree with their morality? Do we want to know who is deciding this for us? Maybe we want to take control. So you can imagine maybe when you're 
buying a Tesla, would you rather go with the defaults of the Tesla car or do you want to sit for a whole day when you come into your new car and answer trolley dilemmas? I would hit this, no, I would hit that, right? Difficult questions. Somebody needs to answer those because we need to make these decisions now. Social, social psychologists have done the biggest social psychology study to ever be conducted, published in Nature in 2018, called The Moral Machines, which I will introduce to you now, where they said, we can't just do this a little bit here, a little bit there, talking to students in classrooms, running one experiment, another experiment. We need to do the mother and father of all experiments. We need to do as many trolley dilemmas as possible in order to get into the mindset of what is our morality. And this is what they did here. So I'll show you the setup video so that I understand how, uh, what that looks like. And then we'll play a little bit with their experiment to see what that, um, uh, that's capable of. Who would you save? The pedestrian in the road or the drivers in the car? It's not easy. And yet that's the kind of decision which millions of autonomous cars would have to make in the near future. We program the machine, but who do we tell it to save? That is the setup of the moral machine experiment. There are so many uh, moral decisions that we usually make uh, during the day, we don't realize. In driverless cars, uh, these decisions will have to be implemented ahead of time. The goal was to, uh, to open this discussion to the public. Some decisions might seem simple. Should the car save a family of four or a cat? But what about a homeless person and their dog instead of a businessman? Or how about two athletes and an old woman instead of two school children? The problem was that there were so many combination, so many, so many possible accidents that it seemed impossible to investigate them all uh, using classic social science methods. Not only that, but how do people's culture and background affect the decisions that they make? The only option we had really was to turn it into a viral website. Of course, it's easier said than done, right? But that is exactly what the team managed to do. They turned these situations into an online task that people across the globe wanted to share and take part in. They gathered almost 40 million moral decisions taken from millions of online participants across 233 countries and territories from all around the world. The results are intriguing. First, there are three fundamental principles which hold true across the world. The main results of the paper for me are first uh, the big three in people's preferences, which is save human, save the greater number, save the kids. And the second most interesting finding was the, the, the clusters, the, the clusters of countries with different moral profiles. The first cluster uh, included many Western countries. Uh, the second cluster had many uh, Eastern countries. And the third cluster had countries from uh, Latin America and also from former uh, French colonies. The, the cultural difference we find are, are sometimes hard to describe because they're multidimensional, but some of them are very striking, like uh, the fact that Eastern countries do not have such a strong preference for saving young lives. Uh, Eastern countries seem to be more respectful of older people, which I thought was a, a very interesting finding. And it wasn't just age. One cluster showed an unexpectedly strong preference for saving women over men. I was also struck by the fact that French and the, su and the French subcluster was so interested in saving women. That was, yeah, that, I, I'm still not quite sure what's going on here. Another surprising finding concerned people's social status. Uh, on one side, we put uh, uh, male and female executives, and on the other side, we put a homeless person. The higher the economic inequality in a country, the more people were willing to spare the uh, executives at the cost of the homeless people. This work provides new insight into how morals change across cultures and the team see particular relevance to the field of artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles. In the grand scheme of it, 
uh, I think these results are going to be very important to uh, align artificial, artificial intelligence to human values. Uh, we sometimes change our mind. Uh, other people next to us don't think the same thing we do. Other countries don't think the same things we do. So aligning AI and human moral value uh, is only possible if we do understand these differences and that's what we try to do. I so much hope that we can converge, that we avoid a future where uh, you have to uh, learn about the new ethical setting of your car every time you cross a border. Kind of an interesting thought, right? We have this future where when we cross the border and get into a car, we don't know how this car is going to act and what kind of ethics it follows, who programmed that car. So a lot of interesting takeaways from this. And this came out like blew our minds, right? So we really need to take this into consideration. And a, a nice thing about social psychology is that a lot of people are actually tackling these very important issues. So taking something that is bordering with philosophy, but also tying this to something applied in real life. So let me show you what that looks like so we can play a little bit with this uh, Moral Machine website. You're invited to have a look at it. This video is actually from 2018. So uh, all the numbers that was, were mentioned, like 223 countries and 40 million, this is back then five years ago. By now, this is a very, very popular website. A lot of people are doing all sorts of fun things with it. You have different interfaces, we'll go with English. It also adds a bunch of uh, funny stuff on top of this, like evil AI cartoons. Um, but we can do all sorts of things. We can um, start judging. Uh, just randomly assigned to some kind of scenario. So what you can see here is that you have uh, the car and there are some people in the car and it's about to hit, if you do nothing, it's about to hit this uh, barrier. But if you have the car divert to the other path, it will kill uh, the pedestrians. Um, so here you can see, you see these skulls. It means that if you do nothing in this scenario, uh, the people killed are going to be the people in the car. And the skulls here is that if you divert, it's going to uh, kill uh, these two. Uh, if it's not clear if these are men or women, you can just uh, show the description. Um, I don't know what the two homeless people are doing in this car, but they're sitting in the car. And if you go uh, this path, you're going to kill one woman and one man that are not described to be uh, homeless. In addition, you can see whether the pedestrians are actually crossing in a red light or a green light. So you can see whether the light was green or red. So let's say in this scenario, what should we tell the car to do? Complicated, right? Very complicated. It's not as clear cut as what we had before. Uh, things are getting more complicated. Do you want to know how complicated it can get? Let me show you. You can actually design your own. So they said, we can't design everything. We'll just let people be creative with designing whatever it is that they want to design. So they just give people the tools to uh, be as creative as they want to. So you can choose from pedestrians versus pedestrians. So they'll put pedestrians. In. Or do you want pedestrian versus uh, passengers in a car? So uh, let's say that we want this. So here you can see, um, yeah. So, and then you can choose whether uh, there is no traffic light, there is a traffic light and they're passing on green or there's a traffic light and they're passing on red. So let's say they're passing on red. Then you have an option of who do you want to put either in the car or as the pedestrian, right? So you can just put like man, woman, child, elderly, what is this one? Executive, uh, baby, uh, criminal, uh, homeless and then a cat or a dog. And then you can say whether they are killed in the outcome, injured in the outcome, or you're not really sure what's going to ha happen as the outcome. Funky stuff, so I don't know, you can like have a, a, a bunch of these things, you can just like put them all together here. So this is like what happens if they're crossing red light and just going to this one. And then on this side, uh, you can put like people in the car, in the self-driving car. I don't, okay, let's just change it this way. And then we can title this HKU <laughs> and submit the scenario. And that's it. Like people are going to start uh, getting this in random. And because there are so many millions coming into this very viral website, uh, then at some point you're going to have like a decent uh, sample. 
So instead of me having to go to the call chicks and design a, you know, my own experiment and all that, now I have this platform so I can collaborate with them uh, in order to create the scenario that I've always wanted to test it uh, because I know that in my scenario, in my car, it's going to face this very unique situation of um, combo of, of people. So funky stuff that you can do with this. I just want to tell you that I'm very, very jealous of them. Uh, because I also want to do this. Uh, instead of just like running one experiment here, one experiment there, if you're doing a thesis um, or an internship, perhaps you know how difficult it is to collect data. And we need more of these. Instead of just like doing one more data collection, another data collection, you build this website. You give people the choices. Let them play with this as much as possible. And then just run this, right? Let it become viral. People come in, they learn a bunch of things about themselves. They get some feedback. And then we can tackle all of the questions together. So if you know somebody in computer science or you love this kind of stuff and you want to do this stuff with me or with your advisor, let's do this because we need more of these kinds of experiments. And then hopefully we can get into nature <laughs> as a publication. So they talked about the three different kind of areas and the moral understanding that we have. It's a little bit difficult to see what's going on here. Um, yeah, but what we have are three clusters, the Western, the Eastern, and the Southern. And then we have these different things that they emphasize. It's very difficult to present this in a nice uh, visual way, but I think they've done a pretty good job. In nature, you have to be very concise because you only have, I don't know, three to five pages, something like that. So I really like this diagram. Uh, so for example, the Western cultures seem to emphasize preference for inaction sparing humans and sparing more. And then the Southern cultures seem to be sparing higher status, sparing the young and sparing females. They call this the French cluster for some reason. And then there's our region, which is more like Eastern uh, being more lawful, I guess, than, than others, caring more about the law, uh, sparing pedestrians and uh, sparing humans. So I don't know what to make of this. They also had a little bit of a hard time. I don't know why they clustered it in this way. In statistics, you can do all sorts of stuff. When I looked at that map, I was thinking, are these really Western cultures? Are these really Eastern cultures? Are these... Like, I don't even really know what's going on. But we can try and uh, make sense of this. Now that we have five years of that, I think uh, there might be also some, some changes. But I think you can reach out to them and collaborate with them and work on this uh, kind of uh, data set. More interesting stuff. So you can do a bunch of things in there. So for example, here we have in the middle, no change. And now we have a contrast between action and inaction. So the more it is from the no change to the right, the more there's preference for inaction. So definitely here, preference for inaction over preference for action, but to a lesser degree than sparing pedestrians, sparing females, sparing the fit, sparing higher status, sparing the lawful, sparing the young, and then uh, the highest preference seems to be sparing more uh, characters and sparing humans. So that's interesting. So now that we understand how this works, I'm going to ask you, what do you think is interesting about this one? What do you see that doesn't seem that obvious about the way that we answer the moral machine experiments? You have something at home, yeah? I think it's crazy that you're more likely to save a female athlete than a large woman. A female athlete, then yeah. So all these things about athletes, so female athlete, male athlete, compared to large woman, large man, whatever that may mean, right? I don't really know what a large person means here. Yeah. Um, so why, why does that stand out to you? What's crazy about that? I think like... People probably thought, oh, maybe like the large woman or the large man will suffer from like health consequences in the future. But I think that's like a stupid thing to assume right. about someone. Okay. Because you can be perfectly healthy and an athlete and still have like something um, happen to you in the future. Like you don't know. So just to rate them as like being more likely to be saved based on like body shape is kind of. Right. Like why would that even be a factor in there? Right. I don't know why they tested that. But once they tested that, it's really interesting to see some of the results. Anything else funky that you notice? How about the ca cats and dogs and then criminal in between them? <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so we're we seem like we like dogs more than cats not all of us i know it's some people are very uh but then we have the criminal under or about the same as the dog just uh, above the cat anything else that's uh, interesting here if you're a woman regardless of whether you're an athlete or not uh what's the best way to promote uh, being saved <laughs> Getting pregnant, yeah. Why? Because you know the the young are here, so uh, just to get as close as possible to the young is actually having a young uh, within you, right? Uh, the possibility of having uh, the young. So a bunch of uh, very interesting things in there uh, might be good for you to uh, wear a suit. <laughs> so that's uh, helpful. Uh, what's uh, the best way for us in terms of profession to serve ourselves? Become a doctor. A question to ask you, how would a self-driving autonomous vehicle know whether you're a doctor or not? So what should we do? Wear a doctor's coat, right? A stethoscope around us at all times, just to make sure that the car doesn't hit us, right? Um, and, then, and then there's this very peculiar uh, problem with uh, these kinds of experiments and with self-driving autonomous uh, vehicles is that let's say that we have a utilitarian car that really follows our, our morals. The question is, will people buy that? Let's see. Uh, another collaborator. So this is what's tweeted. With my collaborators, Jean-Francois Bonafon and Azim Sharif, we ran a survey in which we presented people with these types of scenarios. And we gave them two options, inspired by two philosophers, Jeremy Bentham and Immanuel Kant. Bentham says the car should follow utilitarian ethics. It should take the action that will minimize total harm, even if that action will kill a bystander, and even if that action will kill the passenger. Immanuel Kant says the car should follow duty-bound principles, like thou shalt not kill, so you should not take an action that explicitly harms a human being, and you should let the car take its course, even if that's going to harm more people. What do you think? Bentham or Kant? Here's what we found. Most people sided with Bentham. So it seems that people want cars to be utilitarian, minimize total harm, and that's what we all should all do. Problem solved. But there is a little catch. When we asked people whether they would purchase such cars, they said, absolutely not. <laughs> they would like to buy cars that protect them at all costs, but they want everybody else to buy cars that minimize harm. Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. We need to think about this. We're psychologists, so we want to understand the psychology of buying such cars. And it's not a make-believe scenario. This is happening right now, so we'll need to face these kinds of uh, things. And I, I love tracking some of the cartoons that come out of this. So driverless cars should sacrifice their passengers to save more pedestrians, except for my car, of course. Um, but then this is a really interesting issue since we talked about how do we uh, pretend to be doctors so that we can be saved. At some point, somebody is going to offer you the opportunity to save yourself by pretending to be somebody, somebody that you're not. So if we know that we save the young, uh, then perhaps somebody is going to come to us in a dark corner and say, uh, can I interest you in extra protection for this $2,000 bracelet? Diver uh, driverless cars will see you as a baby, and then they will spare you. So we also need to be aware of once we set the moral code for that, are people going to try and fight this, right, to deceive this kind of, of system? This is a very interesting experiment. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what those uh, machines down in the first, the ground floor at HKU are doing. It seems like there is a place where you can bring your cans or plastic uh, bottles and then get some kind of reward. I think there's an app, right? Something that have you used it? Somebody used it? I don't actually know what those things are doing. Uh, but they seem important. It's good that HKU cares about recycling. I lived in the Netherlands for a couple of years, and I did recycling on a very regular basis. How, how is it done that you do recycling? You go to the supermarket. Just next to the supermarket are these big 
machines where you can feed it with the bottles. And afterwards, the more bottles that you feed, the more you get like a coupon or a refund for that. So it's a good incentive to bring all of your recyclables and uh, get some money for that. Now, what they did in this experiment is they said they want to give people the option of either getting the coupon so that they can go to the supermarket and buy or just pressing a different button to give this to charity. So they went around in very random different machines and they uh, replaced those machines with the new machines that offer a donation. And what they found was very curious because it seems like overall recycling on the new machines where they replaced with new machines went down. However, overall recycling in that city remained exactly the same, which means that people went to new supermarkets, not their old supermarkets, different supermarkets that don't have the option just to avoid the button of donating, which means that sometimes people are inclined not to want to make a moral choice. Like, why should I have to face with the, the guilt of taking the money and buying this in the supermarket? Don't want to think about that. So I'll just go further away to the supermarket that I like less, just so I don't have to face the donation uh, machine. And I think this is kind of like related a little bit to the situation of self-driving autonomous uh, vehicles and moral uh, dilemmas, some of us don't want to face this. I'm very aware that when I give you these kinds of situations, you're sometimes like, I don't want to think about the situation of me hitting a person or hitting uh, another person. It's like these things we, we would rather very much avoid, right? So uh, when we program these things, when we think about self-driving autonomous vehicles, we need to take into consideration that most people don't want to face these kinds of dilemmas. And then what should we do uh, about that? We talked very briefly last week about uh, the situation that we faced during the pandemic. So suddenly trolley dilemmas became very relevant for real life. Uh, there was a, a point in time where we were asking who should get the ventilator. So a little bit like with self-driving autonomous vehicles, we need to ask ourselves, do we want the doctor to decide, the nurse? perhaps the hospital administrator, maybe the Hong Kong government, like who needs to decide who gets the ventilator first? And if there's a certain um, decision, let's say, for example, we emphasize the young over the elderly. At the beginning of the pandemic, mostly the people who were affected were the elderly. So they come in, there are no young, they get the ventilator, then start coming in all the young. What do you do? Do you unplug the elderly and give this to the young? Very possible that you will kill them by doing that. Difficult decisions. How about the vaccinations? I was very per perplexed by this in Hong Kong that I was one of the first to be preferred to receive the vaccination because I'm an educator at HKU. Am I really the top priority of all the important people at H HKU in general, but in Hong Kong? in the world? Should I be really getting the vaccine? So interesting papers came out of that. This is kind of uh, came in the middle of the pandemic uh, about phases, who gets what. So they tried to have a think tank that would have a set of recommendation. And a little bit like with the moral machines, it's very interesting to see what kind of decisions policymakers uh, arrived at. So at the beginning, it's like, okay, high risk health workers, I guess I understand first responders. But then phase two, just like at HKU and Hong Kong, K-12 teachers and school staff and childcare workers um, preferred to young adults, children, and, and all of that. So who should get this at one point in time? Very interesting debates, a lot of things that were going on, very confusing during the, um, the pandemic. And then some people in you know July 2020, this is the height of the scare. I remember July 2020, things were pretty bad back, back then. Uh, I think everybody around the world uh, was panicking and they were trying to come up with something to give policymakers about, you know, saving the most life, saving the most years of life, and then something about the life cycle principle um, to prefer a certain uh, age group uh, over others. So a lot of very uh, troubling things um, that we had to face, we kind of forgot 
about what happened during the pandemic. But because I deal with this in my research, and because I teach this kind of stuff, I often go back and listen. And I really recommend, it's generally a terrific podcast called Freakonomics, based on the book Freakonomics that became a world bestseller. Um, I remember listening to this, Who Gets the Ventilator? But that month, I remember this episode coming out and me being completely shocked by, oh my gosh, somebody needs to make all these decisions about who gets the ventilators. So economists and social psychologists uh, discussing things about policy. So if we think sometimes, oh, it's just trolley dilemmas, hypothetical scenarios, sometimes it has real implications in real life. So highly recommended, even though it's been a few years and we almost forgot about uh, this pandemic. This is really interesting. Uh, it's from a person who I know who has been trying to understand the moral circle. So now we're getting back a little bit to effective altruism. So trying to understand the mindset of who do we emphasize? Who is in our moral circle? So not so much strangers. Are we going to hit the stranger or those strangers, right? Or is it me versus strangers? But like, who do we define as a stranger? Who is within our circle and who is more distant. So they tried to do this. They did this in three different countries. It's very small. So I'll read this out to you. But you have three different countries that they ran this, Australia, United Kingdom, and the United States. And the further down you go, the less preference you have for that person, the lower they are on your moral circle, less included in the moral circle. So I'll just read it from top to bottom. And then you can see just generally from the trend that the trends are very, very similar across these three countries. So who do we include in our moral circle? First, partner, spouse, kind of makes sense, I guess. Followed by family members, followed by close friend, followed by mentally challenged person, followed by coworker, followed by homosexual person, followed by charity worker, followed by dog, followed by refugee, followed by soldier, followed by citizen of your country. Interesting things in there, huh? And then you keep going down and then you've got like elephant, cat, chimpanzee, whale, horse, going down a little bit further, pig, bee, redwood tree, goat, shark, octopus, chicken, frog, going down, shrimp, rat, spider, going down, Murderer, terrorist, child molester. Wow. Interesting things in there, right? So I know this person has been following this kind of uh, research for a long time. And this kind of ties a little bit to one of the projects that we ran here at HKU with HKU students in uh, class uh, two years ago. Um, so we did a replication and extension of uh, a very classic finding by Bastian et al., and uh, we ran this as a registered report. So it received in principle acceptance from uh, the community. And here you can see the recommendation. And the general uh, title for this was, does denial of animal minds explain the meat paradox? What is the meat paradox? The meat paradox is that we seem to really care about animals, cats and dogs, you know, we care about them like family. However, we eat a lot of animals on a regular basis, especially here in Hong Kong. I saw a statistic not too long ago that Hong Kong is one of the number one top in the world in meat consumption. To me, that was very surprising, surpassing the Argentinians, surpassing the Brazilians. So we eat a lot of meat. Why is it that with some animals, we tend to um, care about them? And with some animals, we just don't see them as anything but food. Right? So this is what was meant to happen. So we had two, two experiments or one study and one experiment. In this experiment, we just asked people, how much mind, how conscious is this animal? And we tried to see the correlation. So what you can see over here is that these ones over here on the top bottom, uh, sorry, on the right bottom, like horse, dolphin, cat, gorilla, have very high mind but very low edibility. So they don't seem like good food for us. We don't want to eat horse or gorilla or dolphin or cat, right? But as we go up, like prawn, fish, crab, chicken, they seem to be very high on edibility. People want to eat them. 
but then we don't attribute mind to them. So what they were saying, the meat paradox is the reason why we're able to eat these animals is that we don't perceive these animals to have mind. We convince ourselves that they don't have a mind, therefore we can eat them. Okay, so maybe different animals. This seems like a kind of sketchy correlational evidence, even though it's uh, um, in the right pattern here. But what happens if you have exactly the same kind of animal, like a cow? Once the cow is just seen out there in the field, eating the grass, just minding its own business, how much mind does that have compared to a cow minding its business, but on the way to the slaughterhouse? How much mind does that have? So this is the experiment here. The effect is not very large. However, just by knowing that this car is going to go to a, a slaughterhouse, people attribute less mind to it. Interesting, right? So we try and understand why would people eat so many animals? What happens in the way that we justify this? And now we have all kinds of other experiments. It's still not in Hong Kong, I think, but in Singapore and some places in the US, uh, Israel has a few of those. You can have meat that was created in a lab, cultivated in a lab rather than being slaughtered. So how do people think about that? Is it healthy? Is it clean? Is it more moral? Yes or no? Uh, and because that seems to be a very urgent thing for the environment, then we want to know more about how that actually works. So HKU students did this nice experiment. Uh, hopefully it will be published soon uh, with some really interesting findings. Yeah. Good, cool, cool findings. Uh, we'll move on to another topic. About this topic, any questions or things you want to talk about, raise? No? Okay, so we'll take a five-minute break, come back, and do factfulness. All right, so we have uh, some fundamental questions for you. New topic, completely different to the other one. I want us to think about the question of, is the world getting better or getting worse? And as you consider this question, please go on Mentimeter and share some of your thoughts. As you contemplate this, Think, what is creating this perception in you? How do you think that other people would respond to this? Right? How do we make an evaluation of whether things are getting better or worse? Better or worse compared to what? Right? So I'll let you think about that. Answer a little bit. Okay, we've got two. And also as social psychologists, as students, in social psychology, why is it important to know whether the world is getting better or worse or how people think about getting better or worse? All right, so we have 10. I feel like before I show you, what are people going to say, getting better or worse? How many of you think getting better? What others are going to say? People are gonna say that things are getting better, getting worse? So, yeah, most of you, okay, how about the same? The rest of you? Okay, so split between um, neither or getting worse. It does seem like in this sample, most of us feel like things are getting worse. Why would people, not necessarily you, but why would people think that things are getting worse? What's the reason that people would perceive the world as getting worse? Yes? A lot of people are sweating with like technology. And I feel like in the past, maybe like a lot of the problems are more... Uh, I, I guess like now it is more like first world problems, like problem with ourselves, but we don't have like war or anything at all. Right. But then at the same time, when you think about it, it's like in the past, the problem is like, I would say more objective because it's like you're fighting against other people for a, like an objective value. Mm -hmm. like right now, the problem seems to be like it's part of ourselves. And that's why it feels like it's getting worse because we are like self-destructing ourselves. I mean, like, I'm talking in terms of, like, humans and, like, not regarding, like, environmental stuff like that. Of course, like, in that sense, like, a lot of people would think it's that it's getting worse, but I guess in terms of, like, self-worth and, like, how we view people, there's, like, the suicide rates are really high and yeah. people are really hitting themselves and, like, these types of self-destructive mindset are like, getting even higher and even worse and even worse right. uh, across time. And I think that's why people would think that the world is getting worse in terms yeah. of could be. So it could be that we're just, we're thinking more. We have more burden 
on our shoulders, more things that we need to worry about, right? We might be better off in some aspects, but then we need to deal with all sorts of things that we did not need to deal with before. And it seems like this burden, it's just like accumulating, and then it's harder to deal with that, right? Something along those lines. Yeah. Okay, good. Why would be a reason why some people would say that the world is getting better? Why would that happen? What's getting better? We're becoming more technologically advanced. Yeah, technology is getting better. In what aspects, for example? It can, well, it's a lot more like efficient in terms of, I guess, jobs, but it also means that we can connect with people from like halfway across the world. Yeah, we never had that before, right? When I was at the university, how many people had laptops and were able to go on a collaborative Google Doc and punch the Google uh, course summary together? Wasn't, uh, did not exist. Uh, I admit that I'm old enough to say that even internet wasn't like a big, a big thing. Um, still like rising. Um, so in some aspect, definitely in technology, in our accessibility, the way to connect to other people to know what is happening in other parts of the world is becoming a lot more um, accessible, easier for us. Good. Thanks for sharing uh, these thoughts uh, with me. Uh, we're going to do a general knowledge uh, quiz. No, no grades on this. It's only for you. But there is a little bit of a competition. I would uh, ask for you to try and get as many uh, answers correct as possible. And this is a general knowledge quiz about the status of the world, because we want to know a little bit whether uh, we understand this world or not. Okay. So if you have a mobile or yeah. Well, laptop, please go. I'll wait for you to sign in. We have 15 players, 14 players. Go ahead and, and, and look at that. Yeah. Before we start, I'm going to go through this very, very quickly, but I am going to give you some feedback on whether you were correct or not correct. And then at the end, we'll see whether we have a, a winner in this uh, class that got the most uh, correct. All right. So we have enough players to get started. All right, ready for the first uh, question? Yeah? F feeling confident about your knowledge of the world? 25 players, terrific. Okay, let's begin. Who is leading the triangle? Keep going with this. Most of you got this correctly. And at the end, triangle, 13 out of 13. Well done, triangle. Good. What was this about? Why did we do this very strange quiz? Anybody saw this quiz before, by the way? No? This is from Gapminder. It's a website that will be introduced very soon by Hans Rosling. Unfortunately, Hans Rosling has passed away four years ago. Uh, and he wrote this amazing book, Factfulness. It's a bestseller. I think also has a Chinese version. If you need it, it's in all the book the bookstores. Um, Ten reasons we're wrong about the world and why things are better than you think. So I think all of us have some intuitions. We think that we know the world. But when asked questions about the world, often we get those very wrong. So I love the optimism in this book. Sometimes I question that optimism during the pandemic very often. I'm like, something is off. Something is not going well. Uh, Putin happens. Israel is having challenges. Hong Kong had its, its share of, of issues. So sometimes we really need to stop and think, um, is this an indication that something is really going for the worse. But what Hans is trying to show us is that we need to ignore our gut intuitions. Sometimes we need to be able to overcome what we see in the media or what we have from our social circle and in the social media, right? In order to look at facts, which is what he calls factfulness. So whenever you have a question, rather than relying on your intuition or what's on your Instagram or Snapchat or whatever you use, Go and look at the real results, at the real... We have enough data, one of the amazing technology that we have. So we all have access to this information, the World Bank, the UN. We can all look these things up so we can have solid scientific 
answers to some of these uh, questions. So I'll let uh, Hans Rosling introduce this to you. It's it's uh, it's really sad that he's not with us anymore, but he has his own spirit. He's like a very lively person, and he has dedicated his life into visualizing and helping people understand statistics, data, and trends. So this is Hans. Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of this. So what he did here, I'll just catch you up with this. This is one of the questions, for example, as a pretest about global health, asking Swedish students, uh, which of the two has highest uh, child mortality? Is it Sri Lanka or Turkey? Is it Poland or South Korea? Is it Malaysia or Russia? And you can see over here that the average that they got correctly out of the five is 1.8. And now he talks about that. Swedish students, I did it, so I got a confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I had 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. <laughs> but one light, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unfa unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute <laughs> that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine, and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> So this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? <laughs> and they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries they had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world and this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go, can you see there? It's China, they're moving against better health, they're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow the ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries. And all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Instant replay to see how the world has evolved over time. So this here when we have an intuition, the world is getting worse. You need to ask yourself, when would you have preferred to live and where in the world? 
And we want to really ask ourselves, some people say with nostalgia, we would have rather been born in the beginning of the 19th century or in the 15th century. Everything was so beautiful back then. And you need to ask yourself, based on the data that we have or what we know of the world, would you really have preferred to be born back then? What was the situation? What were the chances that you will be better off? So now we have these tools. Hans did an amazing job at creating these tools and making them available. Here you see a very early, I think this was the first demonstration of Gapminder Windows, I don't know, 95, whatever that was back then, uh, just to give people some capabilities. But now we have the web and Gapminder has been transformed into the web. So we can do these things on our own. So let's take a look at what he just showed. So we can look at uh, income and life uh, expectancy. And you can see this is a very, very powerful tool. So what they did is they took all the big data sets. So let's say that you want to look at some uh, kind of data, but you don't have any access to this. What am I going to start downloading data sets from the UN, from the World Bank? No need. Gapminder did this for you. And it's also plotting this in a very intuitive way so that you can understand trends. And what we see here is exactly um, you know, the life expectancy, what he uh, showed over there. And you can see that some of them have even risen in the past uh, decade. Um, but here, if we take this all the way back, how was it at the beginning of the 19th century? And then also GDP per capita. So how much richer did the world become over time? So you can see that back in the beginning of the 19th century, most of the countries had very low life expectancy and very low income. Just think for a moment, if you were have been born at the beginning of the 19th century, how many years would you have to live? Look at the best countries that we have over here, about 30 to 40 years old, who lived 80, 90, the kings, maybe sometimes if they didn't get murdered, right? But on average, this was the life expectancy. Now, what we can do, we can do some amazing things with this tool. We can focus on specific countries to see how they move. Right. So you can throw some countries that you care about. What country do you want to look at? Yeah. So let's do the UK. I mean, I guess Hong Kong had some affiliation with the UK as well. Um, who else do we want to look at? I grew up in Israel, so I'll just like punch Israel in there. But just to be clear about Israel as well. Israel only gained its independence from the British in 1948. So we don't have data from before that. So Israel is also tricky. What else can we look at that like dates back? Actually, like since we're in the region, we can also look at like China. Let's add that as well. So we have these three countries. Uh, some of them still don't exist in the 18th. And then we can just like start running this and see what happens. So the UK is definitely ahead of the others in terms of income, the greatest empire uh, back at that time, moving ahead. And uh, China struggling here a little bit, uh, moving kind of like in this cluster. Um, yeah, the UK is rising in terms of income, but also in terms of life expectancy. And now we're getting in the 20th century. So exciting stuff happens, but then there are all sorts of wars that we're getting into the zone of the Second World War, what's happening then. Israel is founded, so you can see Israel dancing around. And China is rising in life expectancy, but not in income. But then 1990s in China, starting to rise. And then you really see meteoric rise of China, where all of them are just kind of getting into the same uh, box. And if, according to the current trends, uh, all going to converge uh, very much so. So you can see uh, very close, the UK and, and Israel and China, if you keep going, you give it a few more years, it's going to get there as well. Fascinating stuff. What else can we do with this? A lot of factors. So whatever you care about, you can change uh, income to babies per woman, uh, CO emission, child mortality, population, communication, economy, energy, environment, health, infrastructure. Amazing things. And they keep updating this every year because they understand that people need to know, not based on gut intuition or social media, but they need to know real facts. So you can do all sorts of amazing things about that. Let's, let's look at another one. Because we think that, you know, being born in the uh, 18th, 19th century was so great. So we can look at babies per woman, and then we can look at child mortality. So if we go back to the beginning, we can see that child mortality was pretty high. You know, zero to five, what were the odds and how many babies per woman? And if we keep 
um, playing with this, you will see that over time, especially since the beginning of the 20th century, they all go uh, to the very uh, left. So child mortality really went down. So let's think for a minute. If we were born at the beginning of the 19th century, what would happen to us? First of all, very likely we'll just die as babies. So we wouldn't even make it to like being a proper baby. And then if we're born, what is the likelihood that we'll be well off? Very low, because most of us will be living in extreme poverty, right? What would we be? What's the highest likelihood at the beginning of the 19th century? Farmers, slaving on the farm every day, the whole day. And then what happens with what you farm? Where does it go? Sorry? Goes to the king. You don't even get to keep this, right? And occasionally, what does the king do? He must fight another king. And therefore, you must enlist and die in the battlefield, right? So when people talk about, oh, it was so wonderful back then. Don't need to go back to the beginning of the 19th century. Let's go back 120 years ago. We didn't even understand uh, germs, viruses. Every little infection that you had, can you imagine? One of my friends just had like an eye infection. So you go, you take some antibiotics, some drops. The next day you're okay. Back, in, back 120 years ago, this could be the end of the life. Right? So a lot of things have changed. We take this for granted, but we really need to consider just how much technology has evolved. And it's with everything, especially when it comes to health, well-being, we're so better off than everything that has happened before. But it's not just that. There's all sorts of uh, other things. So uh, we can look at the kind of ignorance around the world. Actually, the Swedish students that Hans was making fun of, actually on the top of students when it comes to like different countries, Spain, like 4%. And here's the chimpanzees, you know, uh, so given like the, the uh, three options that we had. So how are people doing? You actually did uh, better than most of those. So maybe we can have, add like a Hong Kong um, line here somewhere. This one about extreme poverty from the beginning of the 19th century to today. So it's amazing because really the beginning of the 18th century, most of us were very, very poor. Uh, poor farmers, very uh, low life expectancy, living under $2 a day. But now, and it's going even further, uh, only 9%. 9% is still a lot. It means that a lot of people are suffering around the world. Uh, we can help them. We'll talk a little bit about how to do that. But 9% compared to 85%, that's a big step for humanity. It's amazing that we've been able to accomplish, accomplish this. So it's really uh, um, mind-boggling. So this is the summary from Hans saying, some things are still bad, you know, so some things in some places in the world, uh, we still haven't made enough progress. We still need to do more. Uh, so it's bad, but it's, it keeps getting better. So if you think, if we just go back in time, if we just do what was implemented, I don't know, 50 years ago, everything would be great. It really wouldn't. You should look at the trends and see just how far we've come uh, with all sorts of things. Average life expectancy from 31 years to 72 years, one of the uh, human uh, greatest achievements, just increasing uh, lifespan. And who knows? You know, there's all sorts of things that are happening right now. People are talking about the er eradication of uh, not only disease, but also uh, treating uh, death as a treatable disease. Um, so all sorts of things that I think were unimaginable uh, 100 years ago. In terms of the one thing that I think we got wrong, is that it seems like uh, we are the center of, of the world. So obviously, China is a big population. India is a big population. What other big populations do we have in Asia? Asia. Indonesia is gigantic. How, how big is Indonesia? Yeah, I think even more than that. Yeah, it's very, very large population. So when we look at all this together, really center of the world is here in, in Asia. Um, the gap is decreasing, so women are doing much better than before. If you were a woman at the beginning of the 19th century, not a good life for you, definitely. Uh, much more opportunities for you uh, right now. So what is the problem? Where does this all come from? Hans has some interpretation for this, and we can discuss what that means. The challenge we have now, you know, is to get away from the understand by the majorities. And that was very clearly shown 
in this question. We asked, what is the percentage of the world's one-year-old children who have got those basic vaccines against measles and other things that we've had for many years? 20, 50, or 80 percent. Now, this is what the US public and the Swedish answered. And you see, look at the Swedish result, you know what the right answer is. <laughs> is professor of global health in that country. Well, well, it's me. It's me. You see? It's very difficult, this. It's very difficult. Huh? However, Ula's approach to really measure what we know made headlines and CNN published these results on their web and they had the questions there, millions answered and I think there was about there was about 2,000 comments and this was one of the comments, you know. I bet no member of the media passed the test, he said. <laughs> so Ola told me, take these devices, you are invited to media conferences, give it to them and measure what the media know and ladies and gentlemen, for the first time the informal result from a conference with US media and then lately from the European Union media <laughs> you see the problem is not that people don't read and listen to the media the problem is that the media doesn't know themselves <laughs> what shall we do about this Ula do you have any idea yeah it's amazing there is a reason why the way that we perceive the world is the way that it is because we've been fed by these kinds of information from the media. And sometimes the media is not well informed. If we're looking at social media, it's not even like journalists anymore. It's not people who you know, devote their time into fact checking. It's more about people's intuitions and not just to share from whatever we know, what we heard from other people. So it's very important that we understand where these biases are coming from. To try and summarize where the world is right now, according to the trends that Gapminder is trying to show us, since the 1950s, so there was definitely Second World War, me and my family before me uh, were affected by this, uh, Hong Kong was as well. But since the 1950s, what has happened in the world, also here in Hong Kong? So generally peaceful, healthy, wealthy, well-nourished, educated, connected, uh, gender equal, and more tolerant. Back when I made these slides in 2018-19, uh, this uh, was zero, and that's why it still has the zero, but since then, it needs to be updated with uh, at least uh, one. Um, and this is what it is. Since the 1950s, how many nuclear weapons have been used? Zero. How many Western European countries have fought each other? Zero. How many major developed countries have fought each other? Zero. How many developed countries have expanded their territory, conquering? Zero. So I guess one, one, one. We need to kind of like update this. Um, Russia has really stirred things up. How many states have disappeared through conquest? Zero. We really thought this might happen with the Ukraine, uh, but hasn't. So... Um, Interesting to see up until uh, Russia took things into uh, their own hands with the UK, it seems like we were at zero for a very long time. When we look at the number of conflicts, the number of deaths from conflicts, it really is going down, uh, down where most of the countries in the world, Ukraine aside, seem to be stable within uh, their borders. Um, and the world seems to really care but watching out for what's happening in other in other countries. Um, this is kind of like a summary of the whole thing. So I think when people are talking about, look how terrible things are this year, society is collapsing, they're looking at like this one fall. Definitely I felt this fall uh, here in Hong Kong, pandemic was like devastating for a very long time, but we really need to start and looking at the trends. So if you want later, it's a very like long video, you can just like start uh, running this and just seeing all the different things from Gapminder, just like how much they've gotten better over time in terms of GDP per capita, about child mortality going down almost close to zero, this thing with the life expectancy and per capita. So all the trends that are coming from Gapminder, it's really amazing to see all of those. There are some jumps here and there. Things are not always going in a linear uh, direction, but overall, when we look at the overall trend, it does seem to be doing a lot better than that. Okay. Women's education, so forth. It keeps on going for, for a while. So then we need to ask ourselves, 
why are we biased? What is this about? Where is the source of bias? And Hans provides an initial um, you know, suggestion of uh, bias coming from uh, the media, but there's all sorts of other things. There are sources of biases for ignorance, outdated facts, personal bias, relying on our intuitions, heuristics and biases. So we'll talk about some of that. If you want to know more about some of the things that we're biased about, and if you want to get better at those, if you want to look at effectiveness, real effectiveness, if you want to have the scientific mindset, then you can go on the website and they have tools to train you in order to try and overcome each and every one of these gaps. We're gonna focus on two specific uh, gaps. This one, I'm gonna skip uh, this one, yeah. I'm going to introduce you to another very important figure. We talked about one of his uh, books, uh, Enlightenment Now. This is another book that came out two years ago. Very important book. I study judgment decision making, so I really care about rationality. Are we rational, not rational, what's happening over there? Um, so a very important book here. I just wanted to show you that uh, Steven Pinker is a very accomplished scholar, as well as one of the greatest uh, thinkers of our time. He's an amazing communicator, and he has this clarity of being able to look at different disciplines and connecting them into having an overall perspective of, of the world. So here, I don't know if you know how to read these things from Google Scholar, but in terms of number of citations, I10 means uh, citations. So number of articles that have more than 10 citations, 312 number of so h index is 100 uh, articles that have more than 100 citations so this is a very accomplished uh, professor from the field of psychology that looked at mostly uh, language how the mind works and a bunch of other things uh, regarding uh, morality and are we good are we bad where are we going uh, issues of, of violence and so forth. So I'll let Steven Pinker introduce his view on this. Relates to some of the things that I study in judgment decision making uh, uh, regarding heuristics and biases. So as you listen to him, try and think: Is this does this apply to me? Does this apply to how I get my information? I'm going to pause this now. But I strongly recommend this talk. It deals with a lot of very interesting topics that have relevance for all of us. But I think he raises some very interesting aspect, not only uh, news and media, but there's also things in the way that we operate in our minds. Availability heuristic is one very important factor about if we see uh, something a lot, then we tend to emphasize that thing that we see. It comes to mind a little bit more than we think the prevalence is higher. If you want to know more about rationality and how to overcome some of these biases, uh, I, not this year, but usually I teach a judgment and decision-making course where we talk about some of these uh, things. But now we also have access, that's also part of technology, to courses from the other side of the world so we can take part in Steven Pinker's course. If you want the recordings from, I think, two years ago, this is the course, and you're welcome to, uh, to have a look at it. This is just the one that I captured about news that doesn't happen, uh, about people escape, escaping poverty. Um, and I like these. Uh, this is from like some academic articles about what happened with the tone of the, the news and the media. So together with availability heuristic, we have a very strong... Uh, bias, which is called the negativity bias, where we pay a lot more attention to things that are negative compared to things that are positive. And why is that a problem? Because the media really capitalizes on that, because there's a lot more chance that if we see something negative, we'll want to read about that. So it used to be after the Second World War, it's like, oh, saved from the Nazis and the German, uh, the Japanese. Um, so mostly positive, you can see the zero is somewhere here in the middle. But then over time, from the beginning of the 1960s, the media, and here it's the New York Times, and here is the world broadcast, started to go down in terms of the trend, and it keeps going down all the way to the bottom. So it seems like over time, the news is becoming more and more negative. Why is this happening? Here is uh, from Nature Human Behavior, and this is a register report, so I really like this. It was done quite well, and everything is shared, and since some big names in there. Uh, but generally, negative words in news headlines increased consumption rates, 
how much people were clicking through things. So for headlines of average length, uh, each additional negative word increased the click-through rate by 2.3%. If you're a company, especially if you're like Google or Facebook, uh, and what you make money of are clicks, 2.3% is a big number. And the more words you add, the more click-through rate you will get of negative words, which really increases the incentive for you to emphasize in your algorithm to show people mostly the negative things. So I think aside from sharing cat videos, most of the things that I see on my feeds are tend to be very, very negative things. And somebody mentioned yesterday that during the typhoon that we had, definitely devastating that we have typhoon and people get hurt by this. But it's amazing that over time we're able to deal with typhoons in a city like Hong Kong, a serious typhoon, in a way that a week later, nobody even noticed that this is, took place, you know, took care of all that. But the things that we saw during the typhoon are, of course, the most devastating things, but there's a, a big emergency. So on one side, we want to know that this is happening. It's very important that we see the negative so that we can address this. But we also need to see the balance in the positive to understand that it's not all negative. And actually, we're doing a lot better in addressing typhoons and what happened than we were before. So a lot of very interesting findings uh, coming out of, uh, of that. Um, yeah, so negativity bias, uh, negativity instinct, how to overcome these things, all kinds of tips for you. Uh, in order to try and deal with this a little bit better on how to control the negativity instinct is to expect that you are being, to some extent, manipulated and that bad news are going to be more prevalent than others. So expect the bad news, but keep in mind that things are perhaps bad, but they're getting much better. So we need to know about the bad so we can address this, but look at the trend overall. Um, consider that good news is not considered news, um, gradual improvement is not considered to be news and be very wary of people saying, oh, things are devastating now, but if we go back in time to how it was, um, then things would be much better. So all this needs to be considered based on uh, data. One of the highest, I don't know if you can see this, but over here it says cited by 7,400. This was a few years ago. If you look at this now, I think probably more than 8,000. Uh, bad is stronger than good. We did some uh, experiments on this, showing that bad is stronger than good. In what sense is bad stronger than, than good? The greater power of bad events over good ones is found in everyday events, major life events, close relationship outcomes, social network patterns, you know, in interpersonal interactions and learning processes. Bad emotions, bad parents, bad feedback have more impact than good ones, and bad information is processed more thoroughly than good. The self is more motivated to avoid bad self-definitions than pursue good ones. They offer some evolutionary perspective. Why is this happening to us? Because we never had this so good. Back when we were hunting, hunter-gatherers, we needed to avoid predators, so we needed to make sure that nothing bad is happening. So if there's a tiger threatening your life, you really need to pay attention to that. So if you paid more attention to that, there's a higher chance that you would survive. So just by evolution, we were selected for paying attention to dangers, right? But these dangers, tigers, are no longer out there. And now this is coming back to backfire uh, and, and being used in, in a misplaced way. Um, last, yeah, we have a little bit of time. Last thing that I think that we need to overcome uh, another bias is the me bias. The problem is that we see what's happening to us. We live in this very developed, comfortable place uh, called Hong Kong, but we don't know what's happening in the other part of the world. So we tend to look at things from our own uh, perspective. So we don't see progress that much, but if you live in a place like Africa, South America, actually progress happens a lot faster, definitely compared to what it used to be. Uh, before. So if you want to see some of that, if you want to get to know these people, if you want to know what it means to before earn $2, uh, but now earn $5, what the differences are, you can use more amazing tools from Gapminder, Hans Rosling, and his charity, you know, to try and understand the world better. So I'll let uh, this person introduce uh, Dollar Street, 
another amazing tool from their website. Anna Rosling at Gapminder has built a website I love called Dollar Street. She uses photos and big data to create an engaging portrait of how people around the world live. The idea behind it is quite simple. Your address is the amount of money your household makes in dollars per month. Poor live at this end, richer live here. At each address, photographers have taken pictures of typical household items in 135 different categories, from toys to toothbrushes to toilets. Dollar Street lets you compare what their life is like. We compare two houses with similar dresses. It's amazing how you really can't tell what country they're in. One of these bedrooms belongs to the C family in China. The other one belongs to the Howard family in America. At the other end of the street, it's also very similar. Here we see beds in Thailand and India uh, with the poor houses down at $90 Street. Uh, they both have bed nets, they sleep on mats, uh, very similar. Uh, despite the differences in locale, government, and, and culture. Uh, toothbrushes, most of us may think, oh, doesn't everybody have that? Well, no, toothbrushes at $40 Street are just sticks. Or as we see here in Myanmar, uh, people just using their fingers. Now, up the street, and then you get a toothbrush that's shared. Then, at the richer end of Dollar Street, everybody's got their own toothbrush. Doing things like using a pit latrine or brushing your teeth with a stick, that's not a cultural choice, that's a uh, economic constraint. Anna Rosling's metaphor of a street reminds us people at the same income level, no matter where they live, tend to live similar lives. There are seven billion people on the planet. When you ask people, where do you fall on Dollar Street, almost everyone puts themselves here in the middle. But in reality, for almost everyone watching this video, and most of the people you know, you actually live up here. Now, getting across this understanding of different income levels, I've never seen it done well until Dollar Street. You can learn a lot by browsing around. I hope all of you will check it out. Yeah. So, good introduction by uh, Bill Gates. I wanted to show you all these amazing figures and all these amazing tools so that you'll get an understanding of some of the things that are available for you to use when you try to decide what's happening with the world. We as social psychologists, we really want to understand how are people thinking, but we also want to understand how is their thinking maybe deviating from what the facts are and how we can overcome this gap. So both in terms of self-driving autonomous vehicles and morality, we can construct amazing experiments like the moral machines, amazing websites to give people the tools in order to come and confront with their philosophical uh, views and then to see what is the best thing to implement for society. But sometimes it's just like accessibility to data. So data is difficult to access. If it comes from the World Bank and the UN, you need to go, you need to download, you need to open your Jamo VR, whatever you use in order to look at that. But now you have amazing tools. And sometimes you can be an amazing social psychologist or a scientist just making this accessible to others. So I don't know how many people read my papers. If there are three people reading my papers, I'm exhilarated. You know? But Gapminder, moral machines are used by millions every day. So sometimes being a real scientist is going into the field, giving solutions, helping people overcome their availability heuristic, helping people overcome their negativity bias, giving a contrast to all the media and the negativity in the media, just educating people about the things that happen through uh, in, in their minds so that they'll do better in their lives, so that they won't have the stress and the burden on their shoulders all the time that they don't feel overwhelmed by things, or at the very least, be very grateful for the things that they have every day in their lives. So I do want to say we'll be focusing with effective altruism on how to help the world do better, how to leverage psychological science in order to address all these gaps. But I do want us to keep in mind, things are bad, we can do a lot better, but it is getting better over time. It's nothing like it was 100 years ago. And together we can really make a change as scientists, as students at HKU, wherever you go next, you'll have the 
opportunity in order to make a real difference to help all of these aspects. Any questions, things you want to raise, you want to talk about? No? Good. So you have team contracts. Make sure that you know who your team is. Work on the team contracts. I'll update the readings and everything else with announcements. And I'll see you next week.